Mr. Baldwin, can I get you anything? No, thank you, darling. A stranger's face in a London street. James Baldwin, American from Harlem. At 38 and six books, he's spoken eloquently for his people. Baldwin writes with the compassion that suffering engenders, but also with the poise and shrewdness of a professional. Thank you. Baldwin explores the pain of his countrymen with a kind of inquiring apprehensiveness. In his books, he doesn't show much of his own gaiety and takes the weary stance of a man who won't be deceived, who knows he can't afford to be if he's to get his work done. Three novels, like Another Country, and the passionate polemical essays that form the testament of a writer. This Negro writer. Now, I never really know what that meant. I'm a writer, um, and, I know, and I know I'm a Negro, which is an interesting term, too. Comes from the Spanish word for black. Um, I'm an American Negro. But that means that uh, that's, a, that's a title or a label or, or a way of defining a person which is imposed on one from above. I'm an American Negro in the eyes of the American Republic. Now, later on, of course, I'd become an American Negro in my own eyes, which is a very different matter. Well, it seems to me that you've struggled in your novels. You've struggled to be able to see white characters mm. and to put them across in the book and feel like a white man. But I, I had to do something much more difficult to, to find out the connection between what seemed like a pointless, gratuitous brutality and the humanity of the person that is more or less unconsciously inflicting it because after all, most people are not monsters. it would be much simpler if they were, but they're not. They do things which they're not aware of doing, you know, and you react to it. Very much the same way, you know, you know, you hit me and I react that way. I want to hit you back. And it demands something else to, to, to understand that, that, that there must be some level in which your pain and my pain meet. Now, you're a novelist, in a way, with a message. And perhaps, you know, you don't mean to be, but there is a kind of implicit plea in all of your books and each of your three novels. Yes, what do you think the plea is? Well, in Go Tell It on the Mountain, there is a kind of plea to understand and care more for the Negro in the States. And in Giovanni's room, there is a kind of plea to understand, treat homosexuals with, with more understanding. And in another country, there is a kind of plea for people of different races to know each other better. Actually, I think that um, if I'm novelist with a message, it's only one. Probably, I suspect that every novelist has just one message. In all three of those books, it seems to me the preoccupation is almost exactly the same. Mm. That would be the effort one has got to make according to me. A very dangerous effort one has got to make to deal with other people as so though they were simply human beings. To remember that um, no matter what the details of their lives may be like or how different from you they may seem superficially or what the social pressures are outside of what the psychological pressures are within, to deal with this, this other human being Precisely as though, as, as it is true in fact, you know, he was here, she was here for the first time and the only time to deal with them in some way the way you want them to deal with you. And no matter what price, from my point of view, no label, no slogan, no body, and no um, skin color. Yes. And indeed, no religion is more important than the human being. To kind of search out the human core. Well, the human core in everybody, you know, liberates. One can do it, liberates you. No, it liberates me, because when the chips are down, that's all there is. If I said anything else. But you put Negroes very much apart. Isn't that dangerous? You write, I think in one of your essays, you write about the long, hard winter of, of life that a young Negro faces, a long, hard winter, but doesn't everybody else have to face it too? Well, first of all, I don't think that that's I who put Negroes apart or separate them. It's the assumptions and the fact of the power of the white world which does that. Do you remember there's a line of Yeats that says, too much suffering can make stone of the heart? Hmm. Well, is this a danger? It's a very great danger. But that's not a danger which is limited to Negro writers. It's a, you know, it's a danger which is limited to human beings. And a great many people do suffer to such an extent that, that their hearts turn into a stone, not only because they're black, though I know Negro boys in Harlem. 
and equal women in Harlem. And equal men in Harlem to whom that is certainly true when some have been totally defeated by it. But it's also true for most white people. For example, in Mississippi, and a certain other kind of suffering, which is unadmitted, and therefore worse, have made a stone in their hearts. It seems to me that the whole effort is not to avoid suffering, or the inevitable deformations which one encounters in a life. But to use, then, to use one's suffering to understand the suffering of other people. And to understand that though you have lost some things because you were born, where you were born, and when you were born because of who you became, you've gained some other things. It's a lesson, I think, to look back and wish it had been different. You gotta make the most precisely of what it is. Thank you.